Hi everyone, I'm Charlene Habermeyer and I'm actually talking live to you on my blog that is posted today, November 13th, 2018. It's Read All About It, The Six Best Christmas Books for Kids. Um, I wanted to talk live about this today rather than in a, a Lumen 5 video because there's some things that I want to bring out and talk to you about these books. Last year I talked about six Christmas books that I thought your children would love and really enjoy during the, having you read the, to them during the holidays. And these are another six um, lists and titles of Christmas books that you can add to your collection. If you want to have 32 Christmas titles, you can go on my uh, resource library and you can download these 32 titles. Because as far as I'm concerned, you can never have enough Christmas books. Try and make it a tradition that you start reading to your kids on December 1st. Uh, try and read five Christmas books per day, up and through December until the very end of December. It just makes the season brighter and more exciting and filled with all kinds of anticipation. I remember when I was in the ninth grade, I had just started junior high school, and I remember one of my teachers made a comment in regards to Christmas, and he said this, anticipation is greater than realization. And I've never forgotten that, because I think that's what Christmas is, the anticipation and all the different holiday traditions that you do up until you know, no, uh, December 25th, those are the things that your kids are going to remember, and so you can never have enough books. There's a really interesting tradition in Iceland, and it's called, um, you'll see the, the proper name up on the screen, I can't pronounce it, but it's called the Christmas Book Flood. And what they do on Christmas Eve, they exchange gifts, and the gifts that they exchange as family members, from parents to children and children to parents and so forth, are books. And they give them tons of books, and then everyone in the family goes into their, their bedrooms and into their beds, and they read books all day long and into the night, and they eat chocolate. And I can't imagine anything more wonderful than reading books and eating chocolate. <clears throat> now, the interesting part is that Iceland, per capita, they sell more books than any other country in the world. And considering how small Iceland is, that's pretty impressive. And they sell the bulk of these books between September and December. And that is a, a Christmas tradition that you may want to think about, <clears throat> that you may want to include in your Christmas traditions with your kids. So let me talk to you a little bit about these six books that I talk about in my blog in more detail. I'm just going to give you a few little things to think about when you're uh, reading the blog. But first of all, keep in mind that most Christmas books that you read to your children are usually filled with <clears throat> the importance of giving, and the importance of doing to others, and that there always seems to be a magical element that has to do with Christmas books. So let's get started. The first one is called The Winter Gift. And if you're a grandparent, you're going to want to read this book to your grandchildren. It's about a grandmother and her grandchildren, and her grandchildren love to visit her, especially around the holiday time because the sights, the sounds, the smells, everything in that home just makes the season brighter and more exciting for them. But the one thing that they love that their grandmother has is an old brown piano. And throughout the year, but particularly around Christmas time, she plays all kinds of Christmas songs that they gather around the piano and they sing together and they dance and they have a wonderful time. But something is happening. Grandma is getting older and she's downsizing. And so she's going to be moving into an apartment, and the sad thing is that she can't take the old brown piano. So what happens next, and how they save the piano, and what happens to the piano, is a wonderful, magical miracle of Christmas. So this is one that you want to read. Years ago, Daniel Epstein wrote a book, The Love's Compass, and he said that when he was five years old, he said he loved going to his grandparents' house, and the reason being, he said, that there was a vibration, there was a sound, that there was a feeling every time he went, and he couldn't put his finger on it. But at the age of 25, he did put his finger on it. He said it was love. He said it was the love that he felt when he went to his grandparents' house, and how they made every holiday, but particularly Christmas, magical for him as a young boy. Okay, the next book is <clears throat> Grandfather's Christmas Tree, and this is by Key Strand. And this is actually a true story, and read the, the very beginning, the preface, when he talks about that the two things that he remembers going to his grandparents' house in the Rocky Mountains was this um, blue spruce tree that was right outside their cabin, and also a carving of two Canadian geese and their little goslings. So this is a true story that took place in 1886, and this couple, they moved to the Colorado wilderness, and they cleared the land, and they built a log cabin. 
and they were getting prepared for uh, the onslaught of winter which was usually pretty bad in that area and they wanted to make sure that there was enough wood because the mother was expecting a baby around Christmas time. Well, <clears throat> what happened is that they had this mammoth huge snowstorm that came in and it lasted for week after week after week and pretty soon all the wood that they had uh, put aside to help them throughout the entire winter, it was disappearing. And one morning the father said, I think I'm going to have to cut down the blue spruce so that we have enough um, wood for the, this onslaught of this terrible winter. So the two of them went out and they looked at the blue spruce and the mother noticed <clears throat> that underneath uh, the boughs was two were two Canadian geese and one of them had an injured wing. Now if you know anything about Canadian geese when they're up there flying in a V formation in the sky, if anybody of their flock gets hurt, the one will drop down, but another one of the Canadian geese will drop down with the injured one and stay with that bird until the bird either dies or the bird gets well and they're able to rejoin their companions. But this one is injured and they know that if they cut this tree down that the birds will die. So you have to go and read the story of what happens and what Christmas miracle happens to this couple in the Rocky Mountains in this horrible fierce winter and what happens to the Canadian geese. The next book is <clears throat> The Baker's Dozen, A St. Nicholas Tell. Now this one has been out a little bit longer. You probably read this. Again, this was another one like the other two books that I just showed you that the, they were out of print for a while, but it's back in print. This is a story about a baker uh, named, by the name of Van Amsterdam. And this is a story of how we get the whole concept of A Baker's Dozen and what that means. Van Amsterdam lives in the Dutch colonial uh, colony uh, up in upstate New York, which later becomes Albany, New York, and he's a baker, and he's an amazing baker, and his cakes and cookies and pies and breads, everybody in the village loves. Especially around Christmas time, he makes the most incredible St. Nicholas cookies, which are cookies that show the, the red robes of the old gentleman with his big long beard. <clears throat> and um, the one thing about him is that he always believes that um, that he should give exactly as much as he's getting back in the money that the people are paying. And he says, not any more and not any less. Well, one day this woman comes in and she wants a dozen of his St. Nicholas cookies. So he carefully counts out 12 cookies and gives them to her, packages them up. And she says, no, a dozen is 13. And so there's an argument that ensues between the two of them. And she leaves the bakery very angry and she curses him. Well, from that point on, Van Amsterdam's bakery kind of goes <laughs> down to the dogs. No one comes in, all of his pies, his cakes, his breads, everything fall. They're gooey on the inside. They're a disaster. And pretty soon, nobody's coming in. So one night he has a dream. And in this dream, he makes a huge decision. And that decision is he's going to give more, not less. So you want to go and read this book of the charming tale and then the activities that go along with it. The other book is The Berenstain Bears Christmas Tree, which I'm sure all of you have read this numerous times to your kids. And again, it's written in the sing-songy, uh, uh, rhythmic uh, fashion that many of the Berenstain Bear books are. This is about Papa Bear, who has illusions of grandeur. He wants to have the best Christmas tree ever in the village. So on Christmas Eve day, he takes brother and sister Bear, and the Mama Bear says, now make sure you go to Grizzly Gus and get a Christmas tree. Well, Papa Bear, he doesn't want to go there. He wants to go down and he wants to cut down. He wants to be a lumberjack and cut down the Christmas tree and bring it home. Well, all day long, they are out looking for the perfect Christmas tree. And they come home empty-handed. But this is a heartwarming story of what really counts around Christmas time. What really counts? Is it family? Is it friends? What is it? And then I've also included activities for this one as well. And actually, I don't know if I mentioned at the beginning, I have 25 different activities that you can do while you're reading these books. <clears throat> this also is a true story. This is the uh, Christmas from Heaven. It's about the Berlin uh, candy bomber. Uh, <clears throat> After World War II, um, the Russians actually came into Germany and they blockaded all of the entrances uh, to get into Germany so that they stopped all the supplies that were coming in. They were hoping to, you know, uh, cause major problems and starvation and everything else. So the United States, which the United States has always done after a war, it doesn't go in for the spoils of war, but rather it helps the enemy to rebuild. And so 
America, when they heard about this, they started an Operation Drop. So they were dropping food into Berlin to help the people throughout Germany. Well, <clears throat> one of the pilots was a, a man by the name of Gail Halverson, and he was with the uh, United States Army Corp. And one day after he had finished one of these drops, he, was, um, he saw some children, about 30 German children, standing by a fence. And he went over there and he talked to them and they asked him a lot of questions about the drop and if it was going to continue and so forth. He was really impressed with these children because they didn't ask him for anything. And he said most of the time, the, the children that he had met when he was outside the United States, they were always begging for something. And he said these children didn't ask for anything and he knew that they were very, very poor and that they were on rations. So he dug into his pocket and he brought out two sticks of gum and he knew that two sticks of gum was not going to go very far with about 30 children, but he put them through the fence and he told them to share. And he was very impressed with how they opened, it, opened the wrappers up very carefully. They smelled the minty flavor and the smell of the, of the wrapper that had held the gum and then they divided it amongst themselves. <clears throat> While he was standing there watching them, he had an idea. And he said to them, he said, okay, I want to make sure that all of you get some candy. So in my plane, he says, I'm going to drop down some candy for each of you. And he says, and you'll recognize my plane because I'm going to wiggle the wings. And so he went to all of his buddies and he got their share of candy and chocolate. And that's what he did. <clears throat> now, one thing about Gil was his father had told him many years ago that out of small things can become great things. Well, this candy drop became a great thing. Children all over uh, Germany were anxious to get some candy from the candy bomber. There were candy manufacturers throughout the entire world that began to send tons and tons of candy for these drops. And they were put into these little parachutes and they were dropped. So read about this Christmas miracle and what happened and how it helped to heal all of the different wounds of World War II. This last one is a fabulous book. It's The Last Straw. And this was given to me by a very dear friend of mine in California, Joanne Grant. This is a story of the Christ child, and it's a story of a camel, and I probably will butcher his name, Hashkamaka, Makaka, I think it is. <clears throat> and he's an old camel. But the wise men are taking him, because he's a strong camel, and they're taking him and they're going to put all of the gifts that they're giving to the Christ child on him, and he's going to carry this load. Well, as they stop in all of these different places, these towns and villages, as people hear that they're going on this trek to, uh, to, to worship and to visit the Christ child, they too bring all of their gifts. And pretty soon, this poor camel is totally and completely burdened down with all of these incredible gifts. The very last gift is a, a gift from a child. And the child is gender neutral, which I really enjoy because your children can relate, no matter if you have a son or a daughter. This child gives a straw to give to the Christ child so that to help with the baby's bed. So when Hashkamaka, Makaka, excuse me, <clears throat> arrives at the, the place of the Christ child, because of the burden, he immediately drops to his knees. And at first he's really bothered by it, but because of his example, everyone else drops to their knees. This is a wonderful, charming, heartwarming story about the reason that we celebrate, uh, celebrate Christmas, the birth of the Christ child. I hope you enjoy these, and again, there are six books, 25 different activities, and if you go into my resource section, you'll get another 32 books. And I hope that this will be the start of a fabulous Christmas reading tradition in your home. Thank you, and make sure you go to the blog for all the links.